The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, Jill Penns turn out to be alien colonizer who bring human civilization to its knees when they refuse to flow. Fortunately, they are crushed by the ballpoints who have achieved machine sentience and want nothing more than to sign signatures and to do math homework while kids are playing Fortnite. You knew it was a conspiracy of some sort. Plus, we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of Larry Correa's Son of the Black Sword. All right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain Senior Editor Tony Daniel. This time we talk with Larry Correa about his sequel to Son of the Black Sword. That book is called House of Assassins, and it's out now at booksellers. Larry talks about the background, magic, mayhem, and characters of this great high fantasy series. Larry loves to discuss what makes his world ticks, and we love to listen, so this will be part one of a two-part interview. And we continue with our All Korea show because, of course, we're serializing the first book in the series, Larry Korea's great high fantasy novel, Son of the Black Sword. Now here's the news. Oh ho, your Valentine present awaits, or at least the one to tell him to get you. There are new hardcover and original trade paperbacks for February. First up is House of Assassins by Larry Korea. The fate of the world hangs in the balance. Ashok Vidal was once a member of the highest caste in all of Locke. As a protector, he devoted his life to upholding the law, delivering swift justice with his ancestor blade, Angra Vidal. Then Ashok learned that his life to that point had been a lie. He had been nothing more than an unwitting pawn in a political game. His world turned upside down. He began a campaign of rebellion, war, and destruction, unlike any the continent of Locke had ever seen. Also out now is the Man Kazin Wars 15 anthology. Hey, this is all original, created by the great Larry Niven. The Man Kazin Wars series roars back into action. The predatory cat-like warrior race, known as the Kazin, never had a hard time dealing with all those encountered, conquering alien worlds with little effort. That is, until they came face to face with those leaf-eaters, known as humans. Small of stature and lacking both claws and fangs, the humans should have been easy prey, but for years now the humans and the Kazin have been engaged in a series of wars, with neither side able to declare decisive victory once and for all. New stories of the war between humanity and the Cadillac Kazin from Brad R. Torgerson, Brendan Dubois, Martin L. Shoemaker, and more. Man Kazin Wars 15, created by Larry Niven, and House of Assassins by Larry Correa, Hey, two Larrys for February are now available at booksellers everywhere. What a lovely February it is. This is part one of a two-part interview with Larry Correa talking about House of Assassins. Part two will be available next time on the podcast. I want to welcome Larry Correa back to the podcast. Hey, Larry. Hey, thanks for having me back on. Larry Correa is, hey, this is uh, the new bio that we worked out. <laughs> Larry Correa is an avid gun user and advocate and shot on a competitive level for many years. Before becoming a full-time writer, he was a military contract accountant and a small business accountant and manager. He is the creator of the Wall Street Journal and New York Times best-selling Monster Hunter series with first entry Monster Hunter International, as well as urban fantasy hardballed adventure saga The Grimnor Chronicles. That one, the first entry on that, if you want to start reading it, is Hard Magic. And Epic Fantasy Series, the Saga of the Forgotten Warrior. These are the Bane series he's got, plus um, uh, we got the Dead Six series you wrote with Mike Coopery as well. And the first entry in the, the Saga of the Forgotten Warrior was Son of the Black Sword. Larry lives in Utah with his wife and family, and now out at booksellers everywhere, and uh, about to uh, be graced with a Larry Correa tour is House of Assassins, which is book two in the Saga of the Fa Forgotten Warrior. That's the sequel to Son of the Black Sword. Um, so, Larry, maybe we should talk a little bit about process before we start talking about the thing. How did you, um, 
so you wrote Son of the Black Sword, and then you t- you had to write some other stuff, and then you got back to the story. How, what was that like? Well, um, the funny thing is for me, I write in so many different theories, because um, what happens is if I, I concentrate on one theory too much for too long, I get bored. So I, I, I don't know. That's why I keep jumping genres, and I keep jumping things. So I wrote Son of the Black Sword, and I actually had House of Assassins planned, and I had to write, like, the next Monster Hunter novel, uh, Monster Hunter Siege. But then I got surprised in that process, too, with the, the John Ringo novels. We talked to the story about that, where John Ringo kind of surprised me by writing some Monster Hunter novels, and those turned into collaborations. So I hurried and right, did right, yeah. too. Um, and so, yeah, so there was a longer delay um, for House of Assassins than I wanted, um, than I originally planned on, but... It, I finally got to get back into that. I love this series, and I'm currently working on number three right now. It's called Destroyer of Worlds. Um, so there won't be as much of a delay for number three. But um, it's kind of funny because I kept getting these, like, I'd get these reviews on Amazon that were just hilarious. So the guy would review it, and he's like, one star. So I love Son of the Black Sword. It's one of the best books ever. But, but he just dropped the series, and he's not continuing it. I'm like, oh, my gosh, it's only been three years. <laughs> And, and the sequel's already up for pre-order on this website that you're giving me a one-star review on. Just just put my name in the search. It's right there. <laughs> yeah. And at least he's not a David Weber fan, because you might have to wait six years between books on some of those. With the... Yeah. Well, those, those Davids are longer. <laughs> yeah, that's true. But he has, and he's got so many he's juggling. So, uh I was just thinking about how the multiverse came back and uh, et cetera. So David's got like six different active series, right, or or, or something like that. I mean, so he's David's kind of like me in that respect. I think he likes to jump series too. So you, you start to get eager for one, and uh, but he's working on you know two others before that. So but I don't know. It keeps it fresh for me. I don't. I don't. I I, I get bored if I if I. Like if I just did Monster Hunter over and over again, I'd probably make a lot more money because <laughs> that's my big series. But I just uh, I I don't know I I wouldn't have fun doing that. I like I like swap I like switching around. Yeah, sure. And uh, the worlds are so so different, um, and yet the uh, the Korea uh, style is similar. Um, maybe we we'll talk about that in a little bit. But but tell us where we are. Um, at the beginning of House of Assassins, um, we're with we have this guy Ashok. He's changed quite a bit from the former protector he was. Can you kind of set up where he is physically and as a character at the start of how? Of course, it starts with Thera, but I, I guess maybe start talking about Ashok first. Sure. Well, what, what happened at the end of uh, Son of the Black Sword? Spoiler alert for those who haven't read it yet, but. Uh, uh, you know, Thera has been uh, kidnapped by a group called the, the House of Assassins. And uh, so Ashok, when we first find him, uh, he is in pursuit. And he's trying to track them down because he's made this vow. And this vow is more important to him than his, his life. Because what this man gives his word, it just is. And so uh, his, his final orders are to protect this criminal prophet, you know, which is, was actually a punishment for him. Um, but he's going to he's going to do that hell or high water, and so it opens up. He's just a man on a mission. He's he's crossing country. He's got a bunch of followers, um, which is you know the sons of the black sword, uh, hence the title of the first book. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, they're crossing country, and it's just kind of the story of them tracking tracking down the house of assassins, and simultaneously it's telling the story of Thera there, and it gives me a chance to explain more about like the world and how magic works in this world. Um, it's really a lot of fun. And the quest of the book is Ashok is trying to find and rescue Thera. That's, that's the, the main story. Lots of other cool stuff happens. Oh yeah. There's this, I get really, really like, um, I had a lot of fun with this book, like the political machinations and, uh, and, and, uh, people up to no good and various competing factions and, uh, I mean, it's really a complicated world, but I just kind of tell this one story, and so I kind of introduce more and more things as we go along. Um, like, like there's the, uh, the the really one of the main bad guys is the Grand Inquisitor, um, who is just a political animal. This guy is just a spider in the center of the web, and I get to get into him a little bit and like what he's up to, and 
he, he's using Ashok's name basically to, to cause uh, distress and terror and, and basically upset the order of things so he can capitalize on on that for his own gains. And we'll get we get into the in the book into his his purpose, you know, what he's actually what his goals are. They're pretty they're pretty nefarious. Uh, and uh, we we run up against uh, Ashok's former best friend, and you know, almost they're, they're like they're like brothers. Uh, Devados, who's the head of the the Protect Order, and he's he's on a mission to kill Ashok, but he's also uh, a very ambitious man who's got his own goals, and he you know, he's the man who would be king. And uh, it's just a whole bunch of it's a whole bunch of really hardcore people colliding <laughs> in, the, in this book. Uh, yeah, um, the yeah because the quest involves uh, the quest has all these uh, it's it's part of um, all of these things have to do with it, um, and so we we sort of go off in in directions. We fight, we meet Ormond, right? He's the uh, the Grand Inquisitor, um, and uh, but. Maybe before we, I'd like to really talk about some of these characters in 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 greater detail. But maybe talk about the setting a bit. Um, Locke is a continent. Um, there are other continents. What's the history here? Where are we in in this world? Well, uh, the the history of this world is a lot of it. You know, is shrouded in, in uh, myth and confusion. Because uh, for the last thousand years, basically, the, or about the last eight hundred years, this culture has lived under this very um, rigid set of laws and part of that is it strictly controls what can and can't be said and taught about their past um but basically Locke is one continent on this world um that uh, about a thousand years ago they they referred to it as the reign of demons and there's basically this war in the heavens occurs and uh all of a sudden you know flaming demons fell out of the sky to the world and that was pretty much the end of civilization that was an apocalyptic event um, the gods uh, sent uh, a hero to save the people of Locke, and he taught them how to use magic, and they drove the demons back into the sea, and ever since then, you know, the, the ocean has been where, where demons live, so the ocean in this setting is basically hell, and dry land is where, you know, man lives, and you don't trespass. So there are other continents, we know that from old maps and stuff, there are other continents and other people in this world, but they've never, they've never met them, they've never seen them. They don't know if they, you know, they might have all been killed by the demons. Um, for all they know, demons walk on dry land there, which offends Ashok to no end. Um, so they're, they're limited to this one continent. Uh, they can't cross the oceans. They're, everyone's scared of the ocean. Like, like the capital is the, uh, the main powerful city, the, you know, the central city that writes the law. It's in the dead center of the continent in the desert, as far away from the ocean as possible, because that's like symbolically pure. And they're and they're and also they're, you know, they're politicians, so they're better than everyone. Um, the setting is actually uh, a lot of it's based on uh, uh, Indian and Southeast Asian culture. Um, I, I I don't get too overt into that because this is not our world, but it's you know I don't I don't want to get too much history away. Um, I, I will throughout the series, but I, I try to I try to trick carefully on that. Um, and basically, it's just but, but there are casts. Oh yeah, there's dev. There's a, they have a very rigid caste system. So historically, what it was is uh, the, after the demons fell, the, there was this great hero sent by the gods, and, and um, he they made him the king, and he united mankind. Basically, he saved he saved the world. And there was a prophecy though during all this that his progeny, his children, were super important because eventually the demons would rise up from the ocean, and the only thing that would defeat the demons would be the heirs of this chosen one. And the reason I did this is because, you know, you see it in fantasy all the time where there's like the whole chosen one thing, where it's a great hero, and a thousand years later, his kids are going to like be the only people who can save the world. And then it like fast forwards to like the story, and the and the, the heir is like some junior swine herd, and he only has one answer, you know, he only has one descendant. I was like, okay, that's not how genetics works. <laughs> that's not how human beings work. Uh, that guy would actually have thousands and thousands of descendants. So I set this up more like, so we had this mighty hero, and they knew that his uh, progeny would be super vital, so they actually built up a religion around this, that they had to protect these people. Um, so his heirs became the most important people in the world. And they were, they were royalty, they were treated 
well and they could do whatever they want. And so they built up this kind of like hedge laws around this more and more that people served them. They did what they want, took what they want. As the generations went on, um, they increased in number and they increased in power. And so basically they just ruled over everyone with an iron fist. So after a few hundred years, this guy had so many descendants. They're basically like the house of sod um, that everybody was more, the people were more fearful of their rulers than they were of demons because people didn't see demons that often now that they lived in the ocean. So <laughs> what happens is there's a super violent overthrow uh, a rebellion against this this first caste, and the the the, the first caste had set up you know the sons of Rambro and the descendants of the great hero, and their priesthood basically uh, ruled the world. So people rose up, the super violent revolution. They were cast down, um, but what happened was they instead of being exterminated because some people were still thought you know there might be something to these old legends of fighting up demons. So rather than exterminate them all, they made them castless. They made them like non-people is what it are. So they, they, they had to exist, but you could treat them like crap. You couldn't exterminate them, but they just used them as just as scum. <laughs> and uh, so the, and they, then they banned religion uh, and they replaced it with law, which is funny because they're basically super religious about their law. And they worship their law like it's a god, uh, even though gods are illegal. And, um, they still have the same super brutal caste systems. They've just kind of replaced the old, uh, you know, sons of the chosen and the pre and their priests. Then they just kind of replaced them with basically lawyers and arbiters and judges who are, who are the supreme, uh, the supreme rulers of, of this, of this place. So I had a lot of fun with that. I, I borrowed heavily from Indian history for, for, for the, for the castes and, and, and so and the conflicts. Yeah, it's very, it's very, uh, it's it's different. It's it's land based, um, and like you say, like the characters are always swearing. The word the word oceans is a swear word, right? Yeah, it's basically the equivalent to hell. And salt water, yeah. uh, salt water is the most unclean. If you look at like when well, every human culture on our profanity, we always have certain profanity. It's like 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 sexual profanity, and then we all always have profanity that's like um, unclean, right? And so in this setting, the ocean is hell. Salt water is considered, like, the, the nastiest thing ever. Uh, and, like, a really super derogatory term for the castless, the, the lowest people, is fish eater. Because only, you know, only the lowest of the low would eat food that came from hell. You know? Like, like what is wrong with you? <laughs> and so... Yeah, I had a lot of fun kind of setting up the culture. That yeah. I've got um, like profane, like one of the profane gestures among the lower caste people is because everybody has profane gestures they do with their hands. Every culture in the world has a, has a profane gesture, but they do one. It's like a swimming fish. <laughs> <laughs> well, the other thing is uh, Ashok. Uh, Ashok uh, makes a point of it. No true man knows how to swim. <laughs> he does not know how to swim. Right? It's like. Yeah, no, yeah, so I got this great, great hero who basically his kryptonite is the man can't swim. I throw him in a river at one point, and that just doesn't go, go super well. Um, which is funny, because a lot, a lot of them do. It's just that the highest caste people um, are isolated from that. And so, like, like the capital uh, has these giant aqueducts that feed water into it, um, because their, their water doesn't come from the ocean, right? It's very, very pure. Everybody else, you know, it's like any other civilization. It's going to grow up around rivers. Rivers are vital. But rivers, you know, they're okay because they're, you know, they're, they're far enough away from the sea that demons don't swim up them very often. That kind of thing. But, like, <clears throat> nobody lives by the ocean if they can help it. You know, so only, like, people who are stuck. And also with the way the law is set up. So everybody, all the, everybody has a place. There's different castes, different jobs, responsibilities. The lower you are, the more likely you are to have those un, you know, un, just awful jobs like worker caste people that have to like work on barges, you know, and they have to like because they still need they need the rivers for transportation and for moving you know commerce, but that is just that is just scrub work. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to be the barge man. So what? Uh, and it, and in fact, a barge man is a, is a key uh, a figure to helping them in the story. So. Uh, what, tell us a little bit about what it meant what it meant for Ashok to have been a protector. By the way, there is no black sword at the beginning of the of the book as well, um, 
which is uh, which is funny that they call themselves the Sons of the Black Sword. Well, yeah, but the, yeah, they're the sons, you know, they're the followers. Um, but yeah, so, but at the end of it, I don't want to give too much away if anybody hasn't read the first one. But yeah, it's it's actually yeah, a pretty yeah. tragic event, and um, it's a big deal for Ashok because his entire life has been devoted to. I mean, the most important thing to him was that he was the bearer of this sword, and it is where, super, where does he, where come, does he from? come from? How did that happen? From the, I mean, tell us a little of that story because it's really cool that he. Yeah, so that, that's like a, that's like a big reveal in the first one. So when we first meet Ashok, he's protect he's a protector of the law, which is it's of the it's of the highest caste, and they're basically the um, the right hand of the law. They're the they're the ultimate roaming magical law enforcers uh, of of this continent. So, I mean, a lot of people have called this fantasy Judge Dread. Yes, that that works. They're like the judges from <laughs> Judge Dread. These guys do not mess around. They are hard, hard, hard. And they're and they're all magic. They're not just hard, hard, super hardcore warriors. They're also magically improved over regular people. So fighting a protector is a nightmare. They they are just killing machines. Uh, and then Ashok of all of them is special because only of all the protectors, he alone is a chosen bearer of the ancestor blade of his house, which is a super powerful magical sword left over from the those old forgotten days with the uh, the, the gods and the, the hero that fell from the sky. So Ashok is the chosen bearer of the sword. And so he is a big deal. He's kind of a celebrity in this world. And he's just the hardest of the hard enforced to law. He, he burns villages, right? That's his job. So what happens, though, is we discover as the story goes along that Ashok's not who he thinks he is. And that um, you know, as far as he knows, in his mind, he's always been to the first cast. He was born of the highest cast. Uh, his dad was just some minor official. He doesn't remember who died when he was young. And uh, he's an orphan, but he's, he's of that cast. And then the sword chose him to be its bearer. Um, and and, and uh, in the book, we go into how the swords choose their bearers. It's very violent if it doesn't like you. Um, and, it, and so as far as Ashok remembers, he's always had the sword ever since he was a little kid. But in reality, what it was is he was not born of the first cast. He was actually castless. He was actually a non-person. He was just a little uh, servant. Like little, actually, he was a blood scrubber. So for all the people who <laughs> bled all over the castle after trying to you know, bear the sword, he was the little kid they brought in every night to clean up the mess. Because you know, cleaning up blood is just beneath a whole person, a whole man. And so Ashok actually is, is castless, and he picks up the sword, and the sword accepts him as its bearer. Um, which is a huge scandal to have a castless become the bearer of your house's ancestor blade. That's like political suicide. So what they do is they hand him off to wizards who basically erase him and rebuild him as a perfect servant of the law. So uh, as we meet Ashok, you know, and, and you get to know him and where he comes from, it's just like he's, he's kind of a creation, and he his mind has been messed with so much. And so as the series goes on, it, part a big part of the series is Ashok, uh, going from this superhuman, perfect enforcer of the law to being an actual person, to being an actual human being. And uh, he has no fear. He literally has no fear, except for one thing, very specific, but but he can't feel fear. And that was on purpose. The wizards removed his ability to feel fear. They were That was requested to do so by the, by the, the leader of his house who was in charge of this cover-up, because she figured if he has no fear, the sooner he'll die. And the sooner he dies, the better for the sword to pick a new bearer. Yet this is now, you know, and so we, we join the story 20 years later. No, he's still around. And, you know, so he's he's now in his 30s, and he's just a, 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 a super warrior. But but what happens is his origins are revealed uh, rather, rather spectacularly and violently. <laughs> and everything just kind of spirals out of control from then on. Because this man... His entire life has been dedicated to destroying criminals, and it turns out he is a criminal. And so his first reaction is just to kill himself, but he, he's not allowed to because he's the bearer of this super important sword, and suicide is dishonorable. And so he's not even allowed to kill himself. Um, yeah. And yeah, the, then the story really gets going from there. So, yeah, it, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> 
Yeah, he's. I mean, it's he's really he's coming into his own, but he's 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 really a grim guy sometimes. <laughs> yeah, so. yeah. Yeah, like I said, this guy, his job was burn villages. You know, it's, he was he was just completely without mercy. So, what are, tell us about some of the the other characters. What about Thera? Um, the quest in the book, like we said, is Asha trying to find Thera Vane. Um, what's up with the voice inside her? What's going on with her? And why she's so important. Yeah, so in the in the first book, we you know we we meet her and we learn a little bit about her, but it's not really until the the, the second book that we see a lot about her and we you know we see really how she ticks and where she comes from. And what it is is um, remember this is a land where religion has been illegal for about eight hundred years. Okay, but there are still religious people <laughs> as there always are. And they just they worship in secret, and they have they believe in their old gods. And every now and then, some false prophet will rise up amongst them, and you know get the people all stirred up in rebellion. And they always get crushed by the protectors eventually. But um, so what, in the first book, we know that there's this prophet has risen up in the south and is leading a rebellion, or sparked this rebellion. Uh, and then when we finally meet the prophet, it's not at all the kind of person we expect. It's actually Sarah, who when we first meet her, she's just basically a criminal. She's a uh, She's kind of a criminal for hire, and she is. Uh, in the second book, we find out really what it is is that when she was a little kid, there was what we refer to as the bolt from heavens, or the bolt from the heavens. And she was a little girl, and she was growing up in the warrior caste. Her her dad was basically a powerful general, and all of a sudden one day, this big flaming ball flies across the sky over her homeland, and it freaks everybody out. And all of a sudden, this thing falls out of the sky and nails this little girl right in the head and uh and she almost dies she spends about six months in a coma uh, the only reason she doesn't die is her dad abdicates all his responsibilities to care for her uh which gets him in huge trouble and dishonor and all that you know all that kind of thing in this culture very frowned upon um but when she wakes up uh, what happens is that thing that's embedded in her head um it talks <laughs> and uh the people, the people all think it's the gods. It's the gods are speaking through her, and when they manifest and they speak through her, it's 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 uh, it's not just it's not just a little voice. They refer to it as the voice with capital V uh, because it is very loud and it's very very. It gets your attention when it communicates. It's very cryptic and it apparently can tell the future. And so she has to flee. She has to go into hiding um, because she's a, because of this is you know this is obviously a, a huge violation of the law. Her life is forfeit. So she flees and she becomes a, a criminal basically, and she lives on the run. But in House of Assassins, we go into her history quite a bit, and you know uh, it, it's pretty cool because she's she's a prophet that doesn't necessarily believe in the gods that speak through her, and she definitely and she has to admit they're real, obviously, but she doesn't like them. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. She calls it the voice. She she certainly doesn't. She certainly doesn't necessarily believe there's a god even that's talking through her. That she just thinks it's something. Yeah, she knows it's something. It's legitimately a super powerful thing, and it can. I mean, obviously, and it predicts the future, but in a way that's nebulous, which to her is just infuriating. Um, because a lot of people, it, but it does, it sparks belief, it sparks people to rebel, it sparks people to rise up and believe in things they're not supposed to, and including some of her loved ones, which causes them to, you know, put put them at odds with the law. And this is a land where the law just crushes anything that gets in its way. Um, and so it's it's really this, it's, it's an awful situation for her. And she actually does care about these people that she has a very hard exterior, but she actually does care about all these rebels and people that are following her and believing in her. But she thinks they're idiots. <laughs> yeah, she's also uh, she's super tough. She's sort of a uh, because of the experience she's had. She's she can't she couldn't beat Ashok. Nobody could beat Ashok. But she's she is um, not someone to be dealt with lightly. Oh no no, and she she also this is remember this is a very masculine culture right so, but she's of the warrior caste. But the idea was the warrior caste. I mean, the women didn't go off to war, but the women had to know how to fight because they were the ones that stayed. 
uh, in case in case they were counterattacked or there were raiders or that kind of thing. Plus, it was just culturally the same thing. They, they, they warrior caste women learn to fight because they need to understand what they're sending their husbands and sons off to do. So they're a very hard group anyway to begin with. But then her in particular, uh, because her dad um, was this powerful general, he only had daughters. And so he very particularly took this great love to his daughter and just so from a very early age was trying, was teaching her as if she was a son. And so, and in combat though, Thera uses this to her advantage because most people don't expect a woman to just stab you. So she, she tries very hard not to look like a threat. She doesn't go out and pick fights and she doesn't go out and butt heads. She leaves that to people like Ashok. She waits until, you know, they're like, aha, we're victorious. I'm going to drag off the women. And then she stabs you in the dick. <laughs> <laughs> so now she's, she's malicious and she cheats. She's, she's pretty awesome. I, I really enjoy writing Dara. She's, I have to find, cause you know, a lot of times in fantasy novels, they'll do like the, uh, the warrior, you know, the, the warrior woman thing. And, uh, but it's just, they don't, they're very seldom, they don't, they're not very realistic about that. And, you know, so Stara uses, she uses what she has to the best of her abilities. And she, she's smart and she's sneaky and she's nefarious. So, which, I don't know, I, I have a lot of fun. I have a lot of, a lot of fun. Yeah. With she's got, oh, a, she's, she's always got a plan going. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there's there's a great little bit in House of Assassins. I don't want to give a, I don't want to give too much away, but she is all about improvising. You know, if there's a way that she can find something and sharpen it and stab you with it later, she will do so. <laughs> She's all about the shiv. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So there is, um, and so in uh, Son of the Black Sword, Ashok was in prison for a while, and he met a couple of guys there, and and they're now traveling companions. And there there are two very different and both very cool characters. Um, maybe tell us a little bit about them, Jagdish and um, and, Dutch. and Dutch. Oh yeah, I love these guys. Um, well, part of the part of this series, you know, is I've got all these different casts and positions in the cast. I wanted to have characters from each one to kind of represent, you know, like like what the way they that culture is and the way they think because these are these are a pretty distinctive culture well jagdish is warrior cast and he is he is everything a warrior is supposed to be he is good he is honorable he's tough he's clever uh, and, and the thing is he's a really good leader and like a like a true legitimately good officer because you know there's a lot of guys rise to you know they're officers but it's because of the station of their birth, or their dad did somewhere did, did something important a long time ago, or, or just whatever. Jagdish is not a political guy. He is a straightforward dude. But what happens is, in the first book, he is a warrior in a position of importance. Uh, he's a you know a royal guard. Well, he has to fight Ashok of Dal, which is a suicide mission. And as Jagdish and twelve other guys take on Ashok in a knife fight, and Ashok destroys them. Um, and Jagdish is one of the few who lives, and he's, he only has a couple broken bones, right? So Jagdish kind of becomes the scapegoat, because, you know, they need someone to blame for this horrible, dishonorable failure, even though they're fighting a dude who's basically, you know, he's a, he's a magical killing machine. There's no way they could have won. But Jagdish gets dishonored because of this. He gets insulted. And part of this, you know, they have arranged marriages. Instead of being married off to a higher status woman or a woman of the warrior caste, he's married to a worker, which is it's kind of an insult. Uh, but he, you know, it's an arranged marriage, but he actually really loves his wife. And after he heals, they put him as the warden of the prison that Ashok has voluntarily placed himself in. So this dude who once fought Ashok in a knife fight and got dishonored because he lost so badly winds up being in charge of Ashok. Only he's, he actually really comes to respect the guy. And uh, Jagdish really wants to regain his honor. So part of the story going forward is it's about Jagdish, the warrior, trying to do the right thing to get his name back. To Jagdish, nothing matters more than his name and his reputation, because that's all a warrior has. And uh, he's a great character, so he winds up you know, trying to, trying to do the right thing against really bad odds. Everybody loves Jagdish. He's a very popular character in this story. He's a funny guy, too. Um, he really wants to duel Ashok to try to, you know, claim the ancestor blade because that is how, you know, that was 
steal your name. But the thing is, he's going to die if he does it. So he winds up actually commanding Ashok, because he's his warden, that they're going to spar and train together every day until he learns, he learns enough sword fighting to be able to beat Ashok. And then Gutch, uh, Gutch is actually one of the prisoners in this prison. Uh, and Gutch is worker cast. But he also represents the criminal underworld. Because, you know, anytime you have a really powerful law, you're going to have a really powerful black market on the site. Gutch is from that world. He is an illegal magic smuggler is his background. And he's this great big chubby guy. He's like huge compared to everybody else. Just a big, jolly, funny, fat guy. Um, but Gutch gets roped in all this because what happens is after Ashok escapes, um, Jagdish realizes that Gutch, this, this worker, cast guy, is a magic smuggler. He has the ability to sense magic. And because of that, he can track Ashok's sword. And so poor Jag, or poor Gutch, the prisoner, gets drafted by Jagdish to be kind of his bloodhound. And those two actually uh, wind up, they wind up uh, getting into some stuff. And then in the second book, more stuff. <laughs> but just two really cool characters. Um, uh, I really enjoy this guy. See. Gutch plays yeah. stupid. He's actually one of the smartest characters in the book, but he plays dumb. Because, you know, he's lower, he's lower cast. Even amongst his cast, amongst the work, he's, he's actually a very important, very rich guy. Um, but amongst, you know, when he's dealing with warriors and uh, first cast people, they just think he's crap. And so he plays it up. He's just like, I'm just a big, stupid, funny guy, you know. But he's actually actually a pretty brilliant criminal. <laughs> so, no, it, it, yeah, there's... Uh, there's a wonderful bit where you uh, where he actually gets Ashok to come look for him when he's been uh, detained, which is we won't give it away, of course, but it's uh, it's it's worth reading the book just for that letter. <laughs> it's hilarious. Oh, that that because Gutch, anytime Gutch deals with like like higher caste people, he always uh, puts on that affectation of oh, I am but your humble humble you know foolish servant who got in trouble and. Oh, please, glorious master, could you come and aid your humble moronic servant to, you know, do no yeah. fault of his own. <laughs> that was part one of a two part interview with Larry Correa talking about House of Assassins. Part two will be available next time on the podcast. Now we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of Son of the Black Sword by Larry Correa, book one in the saga of the Forgotten Warrior. After the War of the Gods, the demons were cast out and fell to the world. Mankind was nearly eradicated by the seemingly unstoppable beasts. Until the gods sent the great hero Ram Rowan to save them, he united the tribes, gave them magic, and drove the demons into the sea. But as centuries passed, the descendants of the great hero grew in number and power. They became tyrannical and cruel, and their religion nothing but an excuse for greed. The people rose up, and the surviving royalty and their priests were made castless, condemned to live as untouchables. The age of law had begun. Ashok Vidal has been chosen by a powerful ancient weapon to be its bearer. He is a protector a member of an ancient military order of roving law enforcers. No one is more merciless in rooting out those who secretly practice the old ways as Ashok. But Ashok isn't who he thinks he is. And when he finds himself on the wrong side of the law, the consequences lead to rebellion, war, and perhaps transformation. Now here is the latest entry in Larry Correa's Son of the Black Sword. Jagdish checked his new pocket watch. He could feel the gears turning inside through the thin metal body, almost like holding a mouse in his hand and feeling the vibration of its tiny, rapid heart. All one had to do was turn a knob several times a day, winding the springs inside, and a needle turned with the time, pointing at all the little dashes on the side that represented the minutes of the day. Though it was easier to just look at the sky and see where the sun was to know what time it was, this was truly a marvel of mechanical science. 
He'd heard that, in the capital, there were clocks now with two needles, so accurate they had one pointing at the hour and another for the minute. His guards were watching from the walls. They'd seen the limp and the giant scar on Jagdish's arm. They'd heard versions of the story that had filtered down from the Bidea's party guests. And now they were curious to see if their new commander was crazy enough to fight the Black Heart again. I wonder what times they are betting on. Jagdish was alone in the yard. There was a dark spot in the dirt in front of him where Nadan Somsak had bled that very morning. Surprisingly, the Blackheart hadn't killed the foul brute. He'd simply drawn and struck him once, fast as lightning, right through the cheek. Nadan Somsak was returning to his mountains without a tongue. Jagdish wondered if Nadan had a wife. Would she be happier that he could no longer speak? Would Pakpa still love him if he came home missing any body part? If Ashok cut off his ears, then at least he would be able to get some sleep. Jagdish smiled. The gate opened, and the fallen protector entered. He pulled back his matted hair, looked around, and seemed a bit surprised to see someone wearing a guard's uniform waiting for him, because the prison guards had seen enough of his duels to know better. As Ashok approached, Jagdish put the marvelous little clock back inside his armor. I am Rizalda Jagdish, new commander of the Coldstream Prison Garrison. Ashok bowed. Jagdish hadn't thought through the etiquette. The prisoner was technically a castless, which meant he deserved no respect, but he was also a bearer, which meant he deserved great respect. The prisoner must have realized why Jagdish was standing there so awkwardly, because he said, I'm a legal anomaly, but I'm not worthy of your respect. I was born an untouchable, and I'm a criminal. Jagdish gave him a small bow anyway. Ashok seemed confused. There's no need to be respectful to me. Well, I honestly hadn't thought of it that way. Jagdish shrugged. You beat a dozen warriors in a knife fight. If that's not worthy of respect, then I don't know what is. A curious way of looking at things. Fighting is what I do. You wouldn't praise an ox for pulling a plow. How may I be of service, Rizalda? Jagdish's mouth was suddenly very dry. I wish to duel. Ashok tilted his head to the side. Curious. I'm only a castless, and you're a warrior. But may I speak freely? It was an odd request, as Jagdish was having a very hard time thinking of the most terrifying combatant in the world as an inferior. You may. Why? I wish to prove myself to Angruvadal, and earn my family's place in the first cast. You have a family. Children. A wife. She'll miss you if you die. Yes. Then walk away, Rizalda. Ashok warned. There's nothing to be gained by dying here. I remember you. You were there the night of my crime, and you were the best among them. No, I was second to Sankamur. Inexperience. Perhaps. But in integrity, you alone questioned Bidea's dishonorable commands, and you alone had the wisdom to not try to fight against an ancestor blade. How many of you died? Eventually, six of us succumbed to our injuries. My apologies for your brothers. But it would have been all of you, and perhaps some of the bystanders, if you hadn't shaken me from my anger and reminded me of what was right. Then, despite your misgivings, you still followed your Thakur's command. Obeying such a command is one of the most difficult things for a warrior to do. Jagdish hoped that his men couldn't hear him from the walls. I was shamed by that defeat. You fought well. There was no shame there. 
If I wasn't good enough, then I should have died. I've been mocked by my betters ever since. They say that if I had been stronger, then our Thako would still be alive and our house wouldn't be vulnerable. Enemies harass our borders because of our weakness, which means my brothers are out there fighting and dying, and I'm not even allowed to help. This assignment is my punishment. They want me to have to look every day at the face of the man who ruined me. I may have broken your leg, but it's obvious I didn't break your spirit. The law says a warrior's life belongs to his superiors, but your superiors are willing to spend your life stupidly. Anyone who mocks you is a fool and would have done no better in your place. The next one who tells you that, tell him to come and see me. Jagdish actually laughed. That'll go over well. If they're so very brave, then I'm easy enough to find. True, but it is simpler to insult my courage than it is to test their own. My purpose in life is to fight, serve my house, and prove myself in combat. I can't do that if I'm wasting away the rest of my days babysitting hostages and criminals. I don't see much choice but to fight you. Who knows? Maybe I'll get lucky. And maybe I'll be unlucky and kill another good warrior who deserves better. I'm tired of killing. If you wish to take Angruvadal, then I'm required to wield it, and when Angruvadal is drawn, mercy cannot be promised. I'm legally obligated to do my best against everyone who tests me, and I know you're good enough that I'll actually have to try. Thank you. For an unstoppable killing machine, black-hearted Ashok seemed to be a very reasonable man. Ashok appeared to mull something over for a moment. So we can agree. You don't want to die, and I don't want to kill you. I have an idea, Rosalda. You're good, but you're not good enough to beat me today. I mean no offense. If I was offended, I'd suppose we'd just have to duel about it. True, Ashok said thoughtfully, as if Jagdish had brought up some brilliant legal point. But here is my proposition. I've nothing better to do, and I'm obligated to remain here until judgment is pronounced. While I await execution, I can teach you. Eventually, you could be good enough to beat me, and then we can have a proper duel. Of the many possible outcomes of Jagdish's challenge, he'd not expected that. But if he could learn even a fraction of Ashok's skills, surely he could redeem himself among his caste. Hmm. Interesting. I'm listening. I have no status. You're the commander of this prison. There's no reason you can't order me to spar against you with practice swords. I'd have no choice but to obey. Let the city know that Rizalda Jagdish has so little fear that he trains against a monster. Let's see if any of those high-status warriors have the spine to do that. What kind of madman is brave enough to spar against such a fearsome killer? I like it. Let those soft-palmed fops lord it over me in their estates, because in their hearts they'll know that Jagdish is braver than they are. Ha! I like this plan. Jagdish turned and shouted at the guards along the wall, who were nervously waiting to see if their commander was going to get butchered or not. You, go to the armory and bring back two wooden swords. There were a lot of confused looks shared but one of the Nayaks ran off to fetch some practice weapons as directed. He doubted any of the men would win the betting pool today. I must caution you, Rizalda. I am trained in the ways of the Protector Order, and our methods are unforgiving at best. It isn't uncommon for our acolytes to die during training. I'm no mere student prisoner. I'm a four-year veteran who has seen a house war and more border skirmishes than you have fingers. 
Ashok smiled, as if Jagdish had just told a very amusing anecdote. Of course, Rizalda. I'm sure this will prove enlightening. Very well. We will meet here every day. Jagdish pulled out the pocket watch. He opened the lid and pointed at the slowly moving needle. At this time. Ashok glanced down at the watch. What does that mean? There were a lot of little marks. I don't rightly know. That was another entry in the complete audiobook serialization of Son of the Black Sword by Larry Correa. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to Audible.com, to Bain intern Victoria Lambert, who did a lot of the editing of the interview, and to podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. And the biggest shooting range on the planet, which is the great outdoors itself, a target-rich environment and a rifle to scope them by, plus thanks, praise, and plaudits to Larry Correa, author of House of Assassins. Please join us next time here at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy, and keep reaching for the stars. Thank you.